So it's basically a robust recovery, back to normal, a new normal, and deep scars. Uh, all right, let's hear it. Which one do you think is most likely? Yeah, so what we're calling a, a new normal it most closely resembles our base case. And, of course, how the vaccine plays out in all of these scenarios um, is very important to driving which scenario we end up finding ourselves in. Uh, because the next 18 months is going to dictate the next five years for the economy. So, you know, a, what we're calling a new normal is that the vaccine does come in the spring, but not before there's a second wave uh, of infections that does uh, uh, drive some risk aversion during that time. So it leaves a little bit more lasting imprint uh, of risk aversion on the consumers and businesses. Uh, and so that in that recovery, it's more gradual than, say, some of the more uh, bullish uh, scenarios. But but that, uh, you know, return to uh, what we're calling a new normal importantly has to come with some assumptions of what does work from home look like? You know, mm -hmm. certainly the work from home arrangements will be lower than today, uh, but higher than they were previously. And then how are we incorporating accelerating technology trends? And that's where the help of our equity analysts became very important in this analysis, uh, because uh, not all is, is, is uh bad uh, when we think about technological advances, especially when they're tied uh, from working from home. Many of those can actually drive productivity gains, sure. which in this baseline help us maintain uh, potential GDP. Right. That, no, that would be a, a sort of good longer term outcome. So uh, just everybody is kind of following here. Of the four potential outcomes, you're basically thinking kind of the second worst is your base case, um, which is to say it's not you know, the worst outcome, but it's not some of the more optimistic ones either. And, and as you said, a lot of this depends on the vaccine timing. But I, I really thought it was interesting, your point about how in your base case, uh, which is, you know, somewhat cautious, you envisioned a 30 percent work from home rate longer term, which is about double what the government is estimating. Why is that figure so high? Yeah. And what does that tell us? Yeah, so our surveys right now suggest that uh, our surveys of households suggest that we've got about 50 percent um, working from home right now. So we are assuming that it comes down substantially from where it is today because many folks will be going back to work uh, or we are having some more flexible, at least work from home and, uh, uh, arrangement and not full time work from home. Um, but that we do end up with double the amount that the government had estimated pre-COVID, that was existing pre-COVID. Now, what have we done? We've proven that productivity does not suffer when we work from home. We've removed the stigma of working from home. Uh, we've put in the technological advances to be able to work from home, and that will continue to deepen uh, over time. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the you know, when we took a, a, a deep dive into more than 700 sectors of the economy uh, to, to look at the capability to work from home, it gives you these types uh, of numbers. Yeah. And getting this estimate you know, just a ballpark of it, right, is important because if we think about consumer spending trends, we, when we work from home, we spend like we're in retirement. So if we take out healthcare spending, which is more age-related, when we move into retirement, we drop apparel expenditures by 20 percent, we drop food away from home at, at, by 8 percent, and we drop transportation expenditures by 4 percent. So all of those are tied to work, commuting, eating out, and purchasing work clothing. And so that's also important to understand work from home because it will shift consumer spending patterns.